Hello everybody, welcome to the joy of Dwarven painting. I'm Hamster. Today we are painting Star Forged, our sci-fi terrain set. We're going to go through the schemes of the core walls and floors, as well as the pipelines and catwalks, so your new sci-fi terrain is ship -shaped. We'll start with the core walls and floors. I am painting 3D printed resin prototypes, so I had to prime them in black. When you're painting your Starforge terrain, it will be cast in dungeon gray dwarvenite, which the Picorni paints adhere really well to. No priming needed. You can start straight on top of the bare dwarvenite. Step one is a simple dry brush of deep lava. And I have good news. You don't have to be neat with this. If you've painted dwarvenite in the past, it's been heavily textured to take dry brush well, and this still has that. It takes the dry brush in an interesting way, but because it's sci-fi armor panels, there are areas that are less textured, and so your dry brush is going to streak and scratch a little bit, and we're gonna let that happen on purpose because we're going for a rugged, worn, wear and tear kind of scheme. So when I'm dry brushing, you'll notice I am leaving quite a bit of paint on the brush because we have another dry brush after this that's gonna cover this right up. So you wanna make sure this does actually kind of get into some of the nooks and crannies. You want it to be kind of patchy. This is sort of the weathering effect that we're going to leave behind underneath the main color of the actual structure. So a lot of times when you're dry brushing, sometimes you keep in mind to go sort of up down motion to catch the highlights in a certain way. Here, you want to go in all kinds of different directions just to get those scratches going on top of each other every which way to get that patchy, sort of worn look. So as you start painting your pieces, what I like to do over a large batch is to hold them all in the same place. Because we have this cool 360 degree design, you do need sort of a blank, unpainted side to set down on the table as it dries. So in your one step, you'll kind of have a second pass where you'll complete the sides you were holding onto and setting down onto the table. But it still goes very fast. I just keep my muscle memory going. I hold them each in the same place so I know that the same areas will be unpainted. So when I go back, it's just a pass over the exact same area over every piece. And I'm not afraid to sort of stab the brush into some deep parts. Like I said, for this step, we do want some of it in the recesses. It's going to show up as wear and tear in the recesses here and there. It does not have to be opaque or even over the entire piece. We want it a little patchy. But we also want to make sure that some of it shows up after the second step here that you'll see. One really important part that I try to get with the stabby motion is this recess in the middle here. I wanna make sure that this effect somewhat shows up on the side of that floor. There are areas that we're going to pick out with accents, like this little detail here. But what's great about the order of the steps is you don't really need to be careful around those parts because we're just going to cover them up with their final step. So right here, this is about being fast, being messy, and just getting the pain down. Normally, I like to suggest that your dry brush has a really light pressure, kind of like a feather duster, and that's good for a really subtle effect over especially organic materials like our caverns or our wildlands, organic natural things. But here I'm being very, very rough because I'm more so going for, a, well, a rough effect, a rough aesthetic. So we can be a little mean to the piece here. The dwarven, I can take it. And a note about holding pieces, as I've been painting this here, I've noticed I've kind of just been holding it all over. Uh, this is a patchy effect. So even if my fingers take a little bit of the paint off, it's not going to be too bad in the end because we're going to cover it up anyway. So again, rule of thumb is to just be messy and be fast on this step. Do go back and make sure you've painted every side, but as long as you're not afraid to get a little paint on your fingers, you can kind of hold onto this at all sides 
And if you take a little bit of paint off, well, you just made a patch or a smudge that'll be a cool effect later. And that's step one complete. We'll move on to our second dry brush step. Step two is another easy dry brush step with a custom blue-gray mix. If it's one part black, it's probably four parts basalt blue and three parts base gray. What I would do is mix your blue and gray and just get a brush full of the black because black is going to be really impactful on your mix. So just add it little by little and add it toward the end because you don't want too much of it. You just want to get that blue in there and then desaturate it, making a blue gray. And between steps here, you can rinse your dry brush. I know sometimes it feels like you won't be able to dry brush once you put it in water, but the trick is you'll rinse it like a normal brush and then give it a pinch on your towel. You don't want to pull but you can just pinch down and squeeze out, kind of like when you're drying your hair, you can squeeze the water out of it. Just give it a pinch to get all the moisture out. There might be a little tiny bit left, but it will be good to go as a dry brush, even after you rinse it. So this is very similar to the first step. You're being scratchy, but in this case, you do want to have slightly less pressure because you want to leave that first step in the recesses. But again, going in multiple different directions to get the scratches to crisscross a little bit here and there. Because this is the main color of the structure, you may have to go back a second time just to get a little more opacity here and there. Again, this can be patchy to leave that wear and tear reddish brown effect underneath. But you do want, especially on floors and maybe flat, areas here and there you do want a little bit of opacity so just give it one more once over so like in this beveled area here there's a little bit of the red i'm not leaving it entirely as a dark recess i'm just making it a scratchy little mix of the two steps once again, make sure you get a touch of it in that side of the floor recess. These two steps are very forgiving. Sometimes you might have a little more paint on your brush. It might be a little wet or a little dry, but it doesn't matter. You can always go back and patch it up here and there. The point is for it to be a little ragged. So that works in our favor. We don't have to be very precise. I really like these two colors. Deep Lava is one of my favorites. If I'm going to do a neutral color, like a gray or a brown, I like to push it into some color identity, one color or another. In this case, a red, brown, or a blue, gray. I think it adds just that little more impact. So again here, this has, is almost entirely opaque. I don't even mind that. This is just one that the grime has not gotten to quite as much, so we're gonna leave it just like that. If something is a little too streaky in one section, just give it another pass in another direction. You won't even see it. It'll just look like more, more weathering. Now, I know this is kind of a wacky mix, so when you have your batch of pieces, before you start, what I did is I made a large batch of the mix. I just went to the art store, got an empty bottle for a dollar or two. I have this little mixing pan that has a pouring spout, and I'll just mix this up. You don't even need as much as you'd think because of the dry brushing technique, but just get this thing halfway full, and you should be able to do a fair amount of pieces very quickly. Then you never need to remix again. If you do this for your first painting session and just get a good batch of your mix going, you'll be set. At Dwarven Forge, we're always trying to have the most impact with the fewest amount of steps, or at least make it really efficient. And I really love how this turned out. With two steps, we do have the typical light to dark contrast, but we also have the warm, cool contrast. And it's almost a weathering effect at the same time too. So I really like how this scheme turned out in this way. 
And that's step two complete. Let's move on to the details. Step three, we're painting all of the metallic details. You're gonna start with a round brush, something with a decent tip on the end since we're being detail oriented here. Start with your Procorni Silver and add just a touch of grime to it. We're using some blue, some brown, and some black. Not in an exact science, but probably three to four times as much as your effect colors, either the blue, brown, or black in your mix, to taste. And we have been selective with the details that we picked out in this color, but because it's a 360 piece, there's a good amount of them. So what I would do as your batch painting is split the step up. So what I'm gonna do is do all of the interior metallic details and then all of the exterior details. And I might even switch this air quotes bottom side with the piping and this detail here for a third step, just so you don't forget anything. It's really easy as you're on autopilot to forget a detail here and there. So if you see yourself doing that, my suggestion would be to split that step up into smaller steps until you complete it. And when I'm deciding how to split a step, I kind of consider how I'm holding the piece. So right now I know I'm doing all the interior pieces and details, but I consider like, what are the things that I can see when I'm holding it this way? Because I find that I forget things when I'm turning it all over the place and then I forgot to turn it one way or the other. So I might even do the side of this pipe since it's sort of close to where we're painting. And so this split step is everything on the inside plus this little side thing. When you're painting these wires or narrow pipes, Try to use the side of the brush. You're creating a perpendicular angle for the raised sculpt to catch the paint. You don't need to feel like you have to draw the line on this detail. Just let the sculpt do the work for you. Really light pressure just until that raised detail catches. Details like this are raised quite a bit, so sometimes I even just hit the paint on the top part, and because this lower section will be in shadow, I'm not worried about even painting the entirety of the thing because it will mostly be hidden, and I would rather have that neat shadow untouched by the metallic than kind of be messy and get metallic where I don't want it, because metallic is a little bit hard to cover up. So it doesn't have to be perfect, you just want to make sure that the details are clear and do it as uh, kind of as neatly as you'd like. Same with this rounded detail. Anything that's rounded, I try to hit the main angle of it. But as soon as you start trying to kind of paint within the lines perfectly, that's when I, personally, I start getting a little messy and there might be a dot of metallic where I don't want it. So I usually don't worry about that because it will just look like a shadow. And then we have a nice, neat looking shape. And when you're picking out these details, Keep in mind that you can always change how you're holding the piece. What you want to do is change how you're holding the piece before you change how you're holding the brush. You want your brush hand to be as comfortable as possible because that's where you'll have the most control. So when I'm painting these pieces, I'm turning them all over the place, even for one single detail like this. And so the angle of my brush is almost the same in how I'm holding my hand. Because as soon as I start doing wacky stuff like this, I'm going to start to lose control. So just don't be afraid to turn these things over in. When you're painting these pipes, you have to be a little bit neat. And so just keep in mind, you can always leave a space, just like we were talking about the other round shapes. You can leave a space here that will just look like a shadow instead of trying to get all the way to the line sort of, and then coming up onto this bevel. Use a fairly light pressure because the more you press down, the more it will kind of spread out and the paint might catch that section so don't be afraid to kind of leave some borders around parts because it'll mostly look like a recess and of course if at any point you do get some paint somewhere you don't want it in the step just go back to your blue gray mix and put a dab right on top of it we've done it so patchy you can just almost do a straight opaque patch dot of paint and it will dry and look like nothing's there This side pipe here is another example of using that perpendicular angle, letting it catch. Got a little bit of metallic here so I can rinse my brush or even take 
different brush. I already have some wet blue gray on the palette. We'll just cover. It'll look a little brighter when it's wet, but when it dries, it will blend right in. And that's step three complete. We'll move on to the final accent. Step four, we're finishing our pieces with some cool glowing lights. I have a few different colors on the palette for this quick detail. Picorni, Bubbles Blue, mixed in with a little bit of white, golden, red, golden green, mixed with a little yellow. Just any bright colors that you want to add, really, for this detail. But these are the ones we're using on the factory scheme here. So on details like this, these round things, I'm kind of trying to emulate glass or it could be a screen virtual screen one or the other so i'm just taking a round detail brush then filling in these details with the blue this is the highest precision step but the sculpt is once again doing a lot of work for us because it's making a nice little area for the paint to pool in and if you do hit this outer rim on this detail just tap it with your finger if you do it lightly, you won't hit the inside because it's so recessed, so you can pull off some of that excess paint. Take my red, do the same thing down here. Just letting it kind of flow. Don't be afraid to get a little moist around the brush so that it flows into that sculpted little pocket. And you may have to do a couple coats, even two or three, to get the full opacity. And what we've chosen to do across the different walls is put a different color on each. Most of them have this red, but then some have the blue, and then some have just a touch of this greenish color. So you can feel free to get creative and break these up however you'd like. We'll do one more coat for opacity on this red. And there you have it. So here I'm gonna show you a cool way to do the lights that we did right at the end. I started with a base coat of white. You can use really any light color in ivory, like a stone edge dry brush or even a caverns dry brush. And that's gonna help with the brightness and opacity of these lights. You can add this step in the core scheme as well. It will help with that opacity. But if you then additionally thin down the paint of your light color, it will have a really cool effect against this light base coat. So it's kind of a glaze or a wash. I'm going to lay it in there, take a wet, clean brush, and just pull it toward the edges like that. Just one quick little step. and it makes kind of a gradient, like a glass lens or something. Don't be afraid too to get a lot of moisture in there. It's almost a whole puddle. Rinse the brush, just sponge it out by with a tap. The brush tip, look at that, that one's even better. And you can let that dry where the little pool of paint is thicker it's gonna be more opaque. So now you have this sort of gradient lens. You need to touch up this first one here. Just a slight amount of paint. Make it a little bit neater. Make the puddle, sponge it out. And there you go, it's gonna dry like that. It won't be quite as heavy as like a pool of, of liquid like that one there, but it will dry with sort of that perimeter around the edge. We'll do the last one here. See, I even had a smaller amount of paint on that one. And so it just did it in one easy step. So as you can see, I did this down here at the bottom as well, and we got a much brighter red in that case. If you want it darker, just do one more layer. Make a puddle. Rinse the brush, sponge it out. Pull it towards the edge, so you'll kind of have it darker on the edge and brighter in the middle. So here you can see this other wall piece has the green accents. This one has the red and blue again, so you can apply these however you'd like across your different pieces. And that is our core walls and floors complete. So for this next advanced technique, I'm gonna thin out some orange and do a little rust and grime here and there with a weathering wash. 
So I have my orange out. I'll just take a moist brush, make a little puddle. You don't need very much paint for this because we're being selective with it. We're not dousing the piece. So I'll just thin out this color, rinse off the excess, and then place it in some of these metallics. If you get a little extra, just clean your brush, rinse it off, and sponge that right out. And remember, when the paint is wet, it's going to look a little bit brighter than when it's dry. You can always add an extra pass, so you can still be subtle. But don't be afraid to really get some good amount of paint in there. Here, this is a good detail to just run a moist brush with this, a little bit of paint right in there. And get some grime going. For this next technique, I'm going to add a little more battle damage using a sponge. I just have a little piece of packaging sponge. A lot of miniatures are packed with this kind of thing, or any packing material with a fine sponge here. And it's kind of like a dry brush. I'm just going to take a small chunk dip it in some black paint, and then rub it off like a dry brush. You want to give it a squeeze or two because it's like a thick brush. It might have some hidden paint chunks in there. So make sure you give it a good rub. Then you just want to dab it. So you're using the sponge to get an irregular pattern going. I'm going a little harder. That was a little too hard, so I'm going to tap it away and make a little smudge. Cool little weathering effect. But just tap it until you're not getting any paint off, and then add some more paint, rub it off. You can always test it on your hand or on the towel. It's a good little patch. And you can kind of vary it, like this is a really heavy, thick patch. There's some finer ones too. But you see how that sponge is kind of making this cool weathering pattern. And further, if you want to be really brave, you can even freehand some large cracks using Kind of the same philosophy of the black here. And we want this to be rugged, ragged, so you don't have to be super neat, but just take your round tipped brush with a really fine pressure and just make a line. Let it do what it wants to do. Just, just use a smooth motion to make a line. You don't need to make it look any certain way until you get to here where we'll make a highlight in a light gray, just mixing some quick white and black. And now you're just going to trace that same line. So just do the same motion on the bottom side if you're thinking of the angle of the piece. I know this is 360, but pick an edge. Rule of cool here. Pick the edge of the line and then highlight it. So this is a really fine detail that you can be selective with. But you can see this looks like a really heavy gash. Now, obviously, a ship or a fortress or a bunker can come in many different colors, and we've even shown you some past paint scheme tests on our Twitch show on the Anvil. So I thought I would demonstrate how to do some of those here. Now, you saw in the core scheme that we kind of did a two-tone effect that did some pre-weathering. So I'm going to start with that same thing, but we're going to do a more neutral brown. So I'm taking what's on the palette here. It's our base wood and black. And we're going to start with that. Now, because of the dark color, this is black prime. The Dwarvenite will be dungeon gray. I'm going to add a little more base wood because it will dry darker than when it goes on wet. Make sure this effect shows up. A little more brown here. One more pass for some extra opacity in patches, just like the core scheme. And now I'll hit it with a patchy, scratchy dry brush, just like in the core scheme, but this time with that Picorni sludge. Going in multiple directions. And look at this even. Before I add some extra opacity, it kind of almost looks like a camouflage pattern. With just the transparency and patchiness. It's kind of cool. 
So you can stop there for something like that. I'm going to go for a little more opacity here and there. There we have it. If you'd like to go even further, I have some Caverns Dry Brush in the mix here. I'll add some of my sludge to that. This says one final highlight. This will add a third dry brush step, but you can be selective with it. Just hit it here and there. Give a good scratch for some quick battle damage. Look at that. Just a really imprecise scratch. There we go. A little highlight real fast. And that's it for our walls and floors. Let's move on to some pipes and catwalks where we have a warm metallic to pop off of this blue-gray core scheme. And I love this scheme because it's only two steps and you can almost get away with one. I would suggest starting with this first step, which is kind of a base coat of a mix of deep lava and black, just to get some warm underpainting. You can see it's very subtle here. I have the black primer and then this step next to it. But the thing is, the metallic paint is pretty transparent. So I think doing this step will let you get away with that metallic step in fewer coats. So you can skip this step and go straight to the metals. It's going to work. But I think this one is helpful to push the warmth and the opacity. I'm using my dry brush, my big flat brush here. But it's mostly a base coat. It doesn't have to be 100% even. We just want a warm layer to push the metallic on top. This is another example of finding where you're going to hold it. I usually do the ends here and then I'll do this underside in my next pass. So we'll let this dry just like that. And then when we're ready, we'll come on back and finish this off. Let's set those to dry. These already have this step, so we're going straight to that metallic. Now we're on to our final metallic step. And I made this kind of a warm bronzy silver just to make a contrast of the blue gray of your core pieces a lot better so it's visually separated when you're looking down at the tabletop looking at your impressive build. So this is just Gorgon Bronze and Sasul Silver. It's probably about three parts bronze to two parts silver. The silver is really bright so you need a little bit less of it to make it still silvery. But to me it kind of looks like some kind of space alloy or sci-fi metal. At least I hope so. But here we will get more dry brushy. I brushed off the excess paint on the towel. But we'll be pretty loose with it here. Get the underside later. Have a little bit of light pressure on these details to make sure that dark base shows up in details like this. But otherwise, you kind of just want an even coat everywhere. Now the catwalk texture is pretty fine and narrow here, so definitely be a little bit careful I usually try to go at kind of an angle to the recesses so nothing sneaks in there. I might even make the brush parallel with a real light touch to just hit the top. Make sure you rub off enough excess so it's not dripping into the cracks. And look at that. You can see that nice pattern. touch up the spot that I was holding on to in the first pass. You might even do a second pass all over just for opacity. You can do this as many times as you'd like until it's as shiny and shimmery as you prefer. But that's the scheme. That's your pipes. This is going to work on the pylon, the stairs, the ladder, the power node engine type piece. This is on all of the pipes. There's multiple pieces that have this warm metal to fit in with the core, but have its own identity. So that's it for painting Starforge. Thank you for joining me. And please join me on Hamster's Hobby Hanging on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern on our Twitch channel, Dwarven Forge Live, and hop in our Discord. We have a really helpful, enthusiastic community 
They can answer your questions, share painting tips and tricks and alternate schemes, and it's a lot of fun. So I hope to see you there. Thanks a lot.